if it protects you, it's the right strategy. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Therapist Uncensored. This is a podcast that breaks down interpersonal science into practical and understandable tidbits. And as you listen, I can just imagine little light bulbs of insight appearing above your head. You're going to be surprised and touched at what you learn about yourself as you get more accurate and in-depth view of your mind and your heart and as you figure out those close to you. Therapist Uncensored brings you decades of experience with interpersonal psychotherapy, relational neuroscience, modern attachment, and anything else they think will be helpful in healing humans. Now, here are your co-hosts, Dr. Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. Hey gang, it is our privilege and our pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Patricia Crittenden. Now, I say introduce you because many of you may not know about her work, but believe me, if you're interested in this podcast, you want to know about her work. She's an American psychologist. She's currently living overseas, but she's known for her work in the development of attachment theory, the science of it, developmental psychopathology, and she created a model. It's called the DMM, which stands for the Dynamic Maturational Model of Attachment and Adaptation. It's another way of interpreting the adult attachment inventory. She worked directly with Mary Ainsworth. Some of you will be familiar with that name. She's linked to John Bowlby and Mary Main, the stalwarts, the parents of attachment theory. So this is very, very exciting to have someone with this kind of pedigree being able to talk to you directly about her own findings related to her research and her study and her clinical work in the field. Those of you who know those names will know how important that this work is, that we study it, that we learn it, that we see what we can gain from it, that we respect it. It's part of where we get our inspiration for the spectrum and the colors. You're going to hear a lot about cultural issues, which is great. Anne and I are always very excited to expand what we already know and be able to apply it to different populations. So that's what you're in for here, fortunately. Now, our interview ended up being kind of long and sort of far ranging. So we ended up dividing it into two sections. Today's episode, you're going to learn about her and some of her kind of overarching theories kind of her way of thinking, which is, again, it's very different. It's probably going to be very fresh. So I know that you'll enjoy it. And then the next episode will be, she'll get more into the detail of her model. It's pretty technical. So some of you will love that and geek out on it. And others, it might not necessarily make sense on the first round because it's so in depth, but we're going to come on and help you be able to digest it and make sense of it and make it usable for you. She's written multiple articles, many, many articles, and several books. She is the founder of the Family Relations Institute and currently serves as its lead instructor and director of research and publication. She also serves as a member of the board of directors for the International Association for the Study of Attachment. Now, like I said, she's done several books, but her most recent one, let's say, is called Raising Parents. (laughs) And what a great name that is. Raising Parents, Attachment Representation and Treatment. That's why we are super excited to bring her to you. And I also want to give a shout out to David Elliott and Dan Brown's book, Attachment Disturbances and Adults. If it were not for that book, we would not have found Dr. Crittenden and the whole model of the spectrum of attachment would have really been impacted by that. So thank you, Dr. Brown and Dr. Elliott. That's a huge thing. And I am very, very excited to introduce you directly to her. Now, what will happen is we're going to pick up in this episode, kind of in the middle of a conversation so that you don't have to hear all the fluff of the thank yous and welcome here and all that stuff. We're going to just go boom right to it. And then again, the second episode, we're going to hit it again, just right into it and talk about the theory itself. Okay. Hope you enjoy. I think you're really, really going to get some light bulbs today. Oh, I could tell you for a while it was very, very bitter for me, but the outcome is I've worked in many different cultures. I've seen that not everybody thinks like an American, raises their children like an American, that there are many ways to be well in the world. And most of my work has been with clinicians, social workers, psychiatrists, clinical psychologists who do not have academic PhDs. They have brought me material like you wouldn't believe 
Marina Van Eisendorn published a paper on 10,000 AAIs. It was a meta-analysis. Well, I've probably read and classified 10,000 AAIs, but it's from 20 different countries and often several hundred in a country. So I begin to see how a culture organizes itself. And I have many, many more care indexes than that from all over the world. And what do you notice culturally? Like what patterns are emerging? Well, you start with the self always. The first thing I notice when I get to a new culture is these people are crazy. (laughs) There's no way you could live with such controlling parents, such unresponsive parents, such, such, such. Until the AAIs start coming in, until the videos of the mothers and babies start coming in, until I have spent several weeks over a few years in the culture, and I'm the only American there. So the only people I talk to are the ones who share their mindset. And slowly, I begin to get it. Here, where the skies are always foggy and the Russians are just beside you. Here, in the middle of Europe, where hordes of people for centuries have wanted your good agricultural land, and they've marched through it to the left and marched through it to the right. Here, where the mountains force people into small little groups of people who can't easily communicate with each other. Here, life makes sense the way we live it. And I now look for the chance to spend, oh, at least a month, but it takes longer than that, in a country, not all at once, A week, two weeks, go home, think about it, view the videos, read the AAIs, come back until I get an understanding of how the strategy that is dominant in each culture represents the best solution to the problems that historically these people have experienced. That is beautiful. So that the strategies that are visible even in the way that we have come to learn to see them are the best solution and the best solution to keep the parent present and to keep the parent available. That's some of the language that you use, right? For the dangers that are prevalent and have been prevalent historically. Yes. Yes. In that country. And for me, the interest is what about when there has been a period of rapid change in what is dangerous. I'll point to three, three recent changes. Since World War II, Western countries have become safer than they ever were before. People don't die of disease early in life. Everybody dies. But our babies don't die. Our mothers don't die. Infectious disease doesn't get us. We don't starve to death. Our poor people live in homes, single-family homes, with roofs, with electricity, with air conditioning and heating, and the Internet. And those are our poor people. They don't live as well as our rich people, but they don't live like poor people in Africa, in parts of Asia. And our news is filled with danger. And how will we respond to danger? It was a graduate student of mine, Angie Clausen, who said, we crave information about danger because we live so safely and we know there has to be danger out there and our brains are evolved to hunt for it. So we look and we look and we look and we look. But in fact, our Western democracies have lived in the safest half century that humans have ever, ever ever experienced and we have fallen in love with the idea of security which is irrelevant everybody survives security no trick to it the patently crazy survive it everybody survives security the trick is to survive danger 
And that's what we are evolved to do. And that's where attachment in the latter half of the 20th century went awry. We got excited about security, but we are evolved to survive danger. Bowlby knew it. His clearest paper early on was about children in wartime London and their evacuation from their parents, their separation from their parents. Early on, he wrote about juvenile criminals and the separations they experienced early in life. He knew attachment is about protection from danger and not the wonderful state of security. And most of attachment work, and essentially all in the United States, has fallen in love with security and dumped everything else in the bad category. My work is about all the things that we do when we're endangered and how stunningly competent even our infants are at figuring out what you need to do to stay safe. Here, in this family, where I was born, with these parents who live in this culture, facing these problems right now, and these other problems that the culture knows about historically. So, a la Yuri Bronfenbrenner, this infant is embedded in a series of systems He only experiences them through the interaction with his parents. But they know in a pre-conscious way what we living here have always known. And they know in a more conscious way what dangers they personally experience. And they may even carry epigenetically Mm -hmm. their mother's experience with danger, and be particularly attuned to what happened in their mother's generation. It's fascinating. And infants, and the preschoolers they become, and the school-age children, and the adolescents, they repeatedly refine their understanding of how to stay safe in this family, in this setting, in this culture, as their mind matures and makes it possible for them to use more of the information that is around them. It's very powerful. And I'm thinking about your focus on danger versus the focus on security. You know, you're bringing in this cultural piece, which is really interesting. And, you know, there's some research on, like in the United States, that if you get a couple of factors like owning a home and having a job and having a partner. So there's a few demographics that will predict security. The demographic predicts that you will have an AAI that predicts security, right? So, sort of. I mean, I have to pick at your newspeak partner. It predicts best when you're married to that partner. Okay. A huge difference in family stability, a factor of seven or eight times in security and stability, in a variety of measures of child performances, depending upon whether your parents are married or not. Really? Really. The data are very strong. It's not politically correct, but I'm always politically incorrect. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm good with politically incorrect. I'm just wanting to be accurate related to some of these cultural pieces. So I appreciate the correction, being married because I was really wanting to just get the data right, because I was thinking about danger versus security. So the security piece is if you have parents that are married, so it was something like, and they have a job, or it was something very basic, or, or they own a home. And surely all those things work well. But if you're looking in infancy, right. you don't know whether that partnership is going to survive or not. If you look at fifth graders, I think I've got this right. Anyway, the data runs something like when you compare infants whose parents are married with infants whose parents are partners, in the fifth year of school, there is a seven or eight times greater probability that the married parents will still be together 
and that partnerships will have broken down and the children of the married parents will be performing better as a group, not as individuals, than the parents of the partnerships. So you need to take the long-term view. Where does stability lie? Stability lies in a promise that you make to someone. I will stay with you for better or for worse until death do us part. And you do that in front of a community that says, yes, we accept you as a particular kind of couple, and we are here to acknowledge the importance of your being married in our community. It's not that there's a cultural bias that your white married affluent person is going to be more secure necessarily, that it's not socioeconomics is what I'm saying. It's not only that. Right. Surely those correlates are there. Okay. But it isn't only that, and this applies equally well when you drop out of the middle class. In okay. fact, it applies better out of the middle class when you don't have other protective factors than the stability of your parents, which is enhanced by marriage, yes. is more important. Okay, interesting. That's the way my whole life is. I'm sorry. I look at everything published and say, but. I love it. No, I could just, I love it. I love it. I love it. So one of the things that you did that was a little bit different than the research that the United States is more familiar with, which was the quadrants and the four quadrants, you reference it as ABCD, not just you. The way that we are familiar with talking about it is in the avoidant and the preoccupied and the secure and the disorganized. And there's a way that your assessment, perhaps this is a good time for you to just talk, you know, and just describe what you do and, you know, just give us a brief update because people don't even know. Like, I feel like I'm sitting at the lap of one of the mothers of attachment that it's like a long lost mother or aunt of attachment that I'm introducing everybody to. So but not in Europe, not in China, not in, not in Europe, in South but I'm America. saying it's a long lost aunt or mother to the Americans in the United States. And I'm like, I'm, I'm taking your hand and I'm saying, look, everybody, look who I found. She, she was lost to us. And that is true. Let me switch to the PowerPoint because okay. that really highlights some of the important differences. All of this that she is going to be talking about is going to be in the show notes. So don't fret at all. And as a matter of fact, if you would like to, you can pull it up even right now as we're speaking, but it will be in the show notes. So go right ahead. I am looking at it with you right now. So go right ahead. Okay, and, and I will try to be very clear about what I say. I'm going to make a few statements about attachment theory. This begins with Bowlby and moves to Crittenden. Attachment functions to promote survival by protecting and comforting the person when there is danger. Attachment is not about security. It is about surviving danger. And that's a completely different starting point than American attachment begins with. And to organize a protective strategy, the brain needs information. If you're going to behave in the context of danger, in a way that will elicit attachment caregiving and protection, you need some information. Your brain needs it. And I'm going to argue your brain operates with three kinds of information. Somatic information from your body. How does your stomach feel right now? Are your hands shaking? Are you aroused? Are you just about dead? Do you feel there's no hope left? All that's somatic. That's in your body. Strong somatic information will override everything else. Mm -hmm. When the signals in your body are really strong, nothing else will matter. But assuming they're in the middle to moderate range, up or down, then you can use cognitive information. You know, a thing I heard recently that I love and I've been working with is that story follows state. And then your brain comes to an understanding or tells a story based on what your neuroception is telling you. And so. I'm saying your state has to be in the moderate to balanced range 
if it's extreme high, extreme low, everything else is wiped out. Yep. If you're going to do any kind of learning, you have to get that somatic state into the moderately aroused, moderately low, or better yet, right in the middle. And you can do that with drugs. I'm talking to the clinician now. You can do this with drugs, uppers and downers. You can do it with exercise. Oh, God. There was just a study published on Tai Chi versus aerobic exercise. And the result was they both helped, but Tai Chi worked better for fibromyalgia. For fibromyalgia. And I argued, well, the DMN can explain this. It's Uh always better to be in contact with other people. So both of these groups are going to work. Social support will be helpful. So both of these groups will work. But if you have fibromyalgia, you're already so aroused. Your whole body is going off on you. You need Tai Chi because that calms you down. You don't want aerobic because that pumps you up. And the DMM can take a study that had nothing to do with attachment and add meaning. Now, second source of information is cognitive, and it's just action consequence sequences. It's straight behavioral learning. The child learns based on the outcomes to their own behavior. Straight behaviorism. And then there's affective information. And this is the information that is processed through the limbic system that comes from intense contextual stimuli. When the loud noises are very, very loud. Or when the lights are very bright. Or very, very dark. That gets processed through the limbic system and you have an affective reaction And that reaction says, it's dangerous here. Or if things are at the moderate level, it says, it's okay. Do other things. Don't worry now. These three sources of information, your body, the temporal consequences, and the intensity of signals in the state, all give you information that predict danger or safety. And the infant learns the meanings of these forms of information from interacting with their parent. If the infant is a little distressed somatically, and the parent goes, "Ah!" and becomes frantic, calming him down, the infant learns the information in my body is more important than I thought. I'd better pay a huge amount of attention to my body and forget everything else. If the parent instead ignores the baby's signals of distress and only deals with consequences, when you get distressed, I turn away, the baby learns, shut that somatic thing down and recapture your parent's attention without that intensity. Infants learn the meaning of the information from the interaction with their parent. Not all information predicts what it appears to predict. You can be very aroused, and there is no threat. The room can be very dark, and it is not dangerous. Your mother can be smiling, and she is angry. So some information has to be transformed so that it will predict accurately when there is danger and when there isn't danger. You can't take everything at face value. And infants in the first month of life learn this. The first month. Now, they don't do all the transformation that adults can do, but they are already learning Don't trust your mother's smile. Ignore what your body is telling you. They're already learning. So infant brains use simple information, and they create simple strategies. That's attachment theory in general. 
A more mature brains transform information in more ways, and they make better predictions, and they organize more elegant, protective behavior. That's in general. Now I want to talk about the individual differences. This is Ainsworth's work and my take on Ainsworth's work. And I need to start with the first difference between the DMM and American Attachment. So you're mentioning Ainsworth. And again, just to back up for folks who aren't familiar, Mary Ainsworth was a colleague of John Bowlby, just to do the hierarchy. And you were a student of Mary Ainsworth. Is that right? Correct. Okay, go right ahead. So I studied under Mary Ainsworth in the late 70s, early 80s. Okay. In other words, I'm not a spring chicken. (laughs) Anyway, attachment is a dyadic characteristic. It connects an attachment figure, usually the parent, with an attached person, which we often think of as the infant, but infants grow up and they continue to be attached. So it's the attached person. American attachment theory has treated attachment as a characteristic of the infant. And when the researchers code, they look only at the infant. When Ainsworth coded, She looked at both the parent and the infant, and I want to emphasize that the attachment is not in one person. It is the process between two people that makes the younger, weaker, more vulnerable one more safe and comfortable when there is threat. So, and when you say when the Americans, are you referring to like Mary Main and Carol George and some of the assessment, the AAI and the AAP? Is that just so that people can have a sense? Just keep going. Every American that you know of who does attachment is probably in this group. Everyone who talks about an ABCD model, they're all the ones that code only the infant in the AAI, only the adult, and they treat attachment as a property of a person and not a relationship. Okay, thanks. Go ahead. So Ainsworth had three patterns of attachment that she found in her infants. This is before videotape. Ainsworth had her students like Bob Marvin, Mary Main, Inga Brotherton, looking at the strange situation through a one-way mirror, no video, taking notes. The notes are typed up as a narrative. And of course, they have carbon copies because we don't yet have computers. (laughs) I want to get you back there in time. Yes, that's been a while. (laughs) And Ainsworth is sitting on the floor of her living room, which is where famous researchers do their work. (laughs) She's sitting there with this pile of 32 narrative descriptions of what the observers saw when they observe the strange situation. And I'm going to leave the strange situation a mystery, may I? Sure. Mother comes and goes, that's all. Yes, yes. Most people are going to be familiar. I just, I'm trying to... And as she does this, she sorts them into dyads, mothers and babies, who behave in similar ways. And she gets three big piles. And within the big piles, some sub-piles... And she does this really special thing of calling up John Bowlby on the telephone. It's going to take 15 operators and a very special cable laid across the Atlantic Ocean to get this (laughs) call through. And she says, I mean, this is in the 60s. This Uh is in the 60s. Uh Guess what I have? I have babies who are really independent and they're going to do really well. And I have some other babies who are, I guess they're going to get it, but they're a little bit shaky. And then I've got some screamy meanies that don't have a future, whatever. (laughs) I'm exaggerating, of course. Right, right, right. No, I get it. And John Bowlby says, hey, don't label these kids yet. Don't make predictions yet. You have a year of home observations that can tell you something about these three groups. Why don't you analyze the data first? And until you do that, just call the groups A and B and C. And according to Mary Ainsworth's 
initial evaluation, the A's were the sturdy, resilient, going to do fine. B's might make it. And the C's were hopeless. (laughs) Mary Ainsworth later said about herself, I know I'm an A. After all the data were analyzed and she understood what kind of rejection of negative affect children who used an A strategy had experienced, she said, I'm an A. So, two points to this story. We have put labels on, and you just used them, secure and preoccupied and dismissed and disorganized, that already structure your thinking about the categories before you know anything about them. I strongly urge you to do what Bowlby said and use a letter that doesn't have any meaning so that your mind is open to discover meanings you didn't expect. It's true. Actually, we use color. We use color now. So. All right. Well, for me, A is red, B is blue, and C is green. I'm a That's what we do. That's woman. exactly the colors we use. <laughs> but it should be neutral. And the thing I understand now, decades later, is that security is not so important. Adaptation is important. Mm-hmm. And if you use a strategy that is the best solution to the problems in your life context that is adaptive, and you will feel good and comfortable and safe. And I would tell you that Mary Ainsworth, as a mostly single divorced woman, had a strategy, type A, that worked well for her, that was adaptive, that allowed her to be very productive and to live comfortably. And it was the right strategy. And when she saw it in the infants and thought it's the best strategy, she was only using herself as a source of information. I am so excited by what you're saying, because that's also what we have found is we are notoriously not very good at recognizing like outside of ourselves, because that's all we know, but that when provided information and new information, these are good things because then we can grow. Like if I'm not aware of ways that I might be shutting down myself or neglecting myself, but with new information coming to me through this podcast or through your lectures or through like, in other words, the adaptation happened, but now my environment is more open and I don't know that I'm too independent with my partner or something like that. But with new information, I can, you know, become more aware Then why not? You know what I mean? That we don't know what we don't know. You don't know what you haven't seen about yourself. Right. And I would urge every therapist to have the AAI given to them. It's an amazing tool. And I would like to be able to say, get it classified with the DMM method. Don't get it classified with ABC plus D. That's not going to give you the result you want. But a therapist needs to know what they bring to the attachment relationship, which is psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. They are the transitional attachment figure Mm -hmm. for the person they are working with. And Mm -hmm. if they don't know that they use an A strategy of inhibiting negative affect or a C strategy of exaggerating negative affect, They can't regulate their behavior for the needs of the patient because they are the tool for therapy. And if they don't know how their tool is shaped, they can't regulate their use of it. Mm -hmm. I want to go back. Yes, please. ABC patterns, don't put labels on them. Understand that your own perception biases how you think about this. Ainsworth called them patterns. I call them self-protective strategies. The difference, I think, is she worked with safe middle-class kids in Baltimore, and I worked with child protection kids in Charlottesville, and I saw that the children not doing the Ainsworth things 
were strategically improving their safety and comfort with parents who needed extra help from the infant to get it right. So I now move and talk about self-protective strategies. And if it protects you, it's the right strategy. That simple. I'm not asking, is it secure? I'm asking, does it protect you in your context? Then, in my model, there is developmental change in the possible strategies that a child could organize. That is, the infant brain is a very immature brain. It's going to go through several periods of neurological change that are genetically programmed, and after that, it's going to be able to use information differently to construct more complex strategies. So A, B, C plus D won't cut it across the lifespan. Ainsworth described infants. And even then, Mary Main and I both said, ah, but you didn't describe everything. Main said, you missed a category that I'm going to call D. And I said, you missed a category that combines A and C. So there is developmental change. Parents differ in their ability to protect and comfort children. That's obvious, but it's how you get individual differences in attachment relationship. And parents differ in the meanings they assign to information. I gave you the example a minute ago. Some parents think that somatic information is really important. Some parents think that attending to negative affect is really important. Some parents think that negative affect is very dangerous. You should inhibit it. And I've said this as well. Adaptation refers to fitting into contexts that vary in the severity and type of danger that the child experiences. I would tell you that American attachment theory and American psychiatric diagnoses, DSM, assume a, quote, normative, safe environment. But when you look at people over all the time that we have been humans and all the places that we live on this globe, it is not always safe. I would even say that's an atypical environment, that the normal environment has danger in it, and you need to adapt to that. So I think we have organized both American attachment theory and psychiatric diagnoses around a false assumption since World War II that life is inherently safe. And I would argue Over our time as a species and across the cultures in which we live, life is not inherently safe. And we need attachment relationships that will protect us in dangerous circumstances. Okay, so those are the central ideas that make the DMM different from the attachment theory that most Americans would have heard about. Hey, thank you so much for listening all the way through. See, I told you you would like her. I imagine you're liking her since you're still with us. <laughs> but before we go, don't hit stop yet because this is actually really important too. In order for us to keep bringing you this kind of very cool, new, cutting edge stuff, we need your support. We are asking for 100 patrons by our 100th episode. It is an ambitious goal, but we're pretty close. We only need 25 more patrons. We're at 75 patrons right now. And it can be as low as a dollar a month. So if you like what we're doing, even a dollar a month will work for us. Many of the tiers are a little bit above that. If you can afford it, it would be super helpful. You get basically different access to different material as you go up the chain, particularly if you're a professional or if you use this for clients or referrals, or even just if you're kind of using it as a therapy and in your own life, we really ask you to give freely so that we can keep making this accessible to people all over the world and be able to find people like Dr. Crittenden. You can find us at patreon.com backslash therapist uncensored. With that, we want to thank some people that have just joined us. We have two folks that you're going to find on our homepage, Mary Ellen West 
and someone named Anne that did not leave a last name. So basically at that level that they're supporting us, which is the Gold Neuron Earns, you get your name listed on our homepage with a link if you want to, to your website. So that's really cool. We, uh, I'm happy to do that to thank you back. And then also we have other supporters. Again, we could not do this without. Other Neuro Nerds include Linda Kirkman, Alex, Christopher Steepleton, Mickey Kuchmarjik, and I'm positive that I just bumbled the pronunciation, but I tried really hard not to. I even looked it up, tried to practice some pronunciation, all of that. We love our international audience, and I just feel embarrassed that I, my words can't accurately represent probably your name. So sorry about that. But also thank you to Dave Fox, Diana Fuller, and hey, Diana, thank you for your speak pipe message. That was super cool. And Daphne Haddock. These are all folks that have recently joined us as patrons. You can do that too at patreon.com backslash therapist uncensored. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. We have tons more coming at you. So hang with us and keep listening. Give us a shout out, by the way. We've got a Facebook group that's super active and a private Facebook group if you want to actually communicate and share information back and forth within the community of listeners. People share resources, discuss episodes, all kinds of very cool stuff. So you can find that on Facebook. It's at Austin Shrinks. Okay, cool. We'll see you around the bin. Therapist Uncensored is Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. This podcast is edited by Jack Anderson. 